The odds are you've never performed a chest decompression. That's because it is very rare. In a study, they looked at a six year period where only 24 of 2,261, which is about 1% of trauma patients, had a pre-hospital chest decompression. If you have performed a needle decompression, please tell us about it in the comments below. In this video, we are going to take an evidence-based approach to diagnosing and treating attention pneumothorax. So by the end of this video, you are going to fully understand what attention pneumo is, how to actually diagnose it, and how to effectively treat it. So to begin, we need to start with some anatomy. The lungs are surrounded by something called a pleural space. The outer the layer is called the parietal pleura and attaches to the chest wall. The inner layer is called the visceral pleura and covers the lungs, blood vessels and nerves and bronchi. The pleural space is normally at a negative pressure. This helps keep the lungs from collapsing. A tension pneumothorax happens when there is a break or tear in the parietal pleura. This allows for air to exit the lungs and get trapped in the pleural space. Because normal breathing is a type of negative pressure ventilation, meaning the ribs expand, this causes air to rush into the lungs and is important to understand for when we look at the differences between an unassisted and assisted breathing patient and how this changes the clinical presentation of a tension pneumothorax. Air trapped in the pleural space is a pneumothorax. Pneumo meaning air and thorax, well, thorax. Once the air in this space increases, it can become too great, which makes breathing very difficult. This is when it becomes a tension pneumothorax. This leads to cardiorespiratory arrest if untreated. In training, we are told to diagnose this by looking for unequal chest movement, or if there is a absent or decreased air movement on one side, to percuss the chest wall for hyperresonance and look for jugular venous distension or JVD and tracheal deviation. However, this is all pretty much lies or rather a misunderstanding. A lot of these signs are very late signs. They are not common signs. They don't even happen or are difficult to assess or badly taught. Another factor that plays its role is that breathing unassisted versus assisted breathing patients present differently as you could imagine. If someone is receiving positive pressure ventilation, this air will be forced into the pleural space, whereas an unassisted breathing patient, the movement into the pleural space is passive. Remember that this can take a few minutes to over 16 hours to develop. 16 hours, I got less sleep than that last night. So in unassisted breathing patients, the universal sign will be chest pain and shortness of breath. 50 to 70% of the time, we will see a tachycardia and a decrease of air movement. Only 25% of the time, we will see decreased SATs, trigger deviation or hypertension. It is important to state that these patients will have a tension pneumothorax, but it is early signs that we are looking at. Only 10% of the time we will see hyperresonance, JVD, decreased level of consciousness and one-sided chest rise. In a ventilated patient, universal findings are rapid decrease in SATs and hypertension. Common findings are decreased air movement, decreased one-sided chest movement and high ventilation pressure. Less than 20% of the time we will see surgical emphysema and venous distension. So JVD really isn't very common. So how do we treat this? Normally, as we thought, we would put a 14 gauge needle into the second intercostal space midclavicular line or the fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line. Nowadays, we have a 10 gauge needle, which is 3.2 inches long or eight centimeters long. So pretty big. The issue is that our 14 gauge needle was not long enough. So we thought going for a, for the fifth intercostal space would be better. But with a 14 gauge needle, the lateral approach is less likely to be successful than the anterior as the average chest thickness at the fifth intercostal is actually bigger than on the anterior side. The anterior approach may fail in many patients as well. Longer 10 gauge needles may increase the chance of decompression, but carry a high risk of damage to surrounding vital structures. So going 10 gauge or 14 gauge comes with its pros and cons. Interestingly, one study found that about 50% of attempts at needle decompression failed to reach the pleural space. In addition, at least 39% of these patients did not have a tension pneumothorax, so it was a necessary thing to do. Using an eight centimeter catheter, such as this one, at the fifth intercostal space also has an increased chance of a iatrogenic cardiac injury. Even more interesting, in one study, not a single patient presented pulseless and with a tension pneumothorax who had not received assisted ventilation. However, 50% of those who had a tension pneumothorax 
and were ventilated presented to hospital without a pulse. So what should you do with a tension pneumothorax? Well, you perform a needle decompression with the right needle at the right location, avoiding major organs. Stay tuned for a story at the end of the video where this all went almost very wrong. The other option is a simple finger thoracostomy. This is the same procedure as a doctor placing a chest tube, which is the only definite treatment for a tension pneumo. However, you don't place the tube. You cut the hole and you push your finger in until you feel the parietal pleura, which is the lung. This treats the problem if it retensions, which they can, and you push your finger back in. This has been studied in the pre-hospital setting and is safe and effective. Once you arrive at hospital, the doctor can place the tube. So for that story that I was um, thinking about, I, I was called to a scene where a patient had been stabbed in the chest multiple times. My crew and I got there and there was a man lying on the floor being treated by another paramedic and the paramedic was about to place another chest decompression. And so what happened is that the patient had the suspected tension on the right hand side and so this paramedic was about to place another needle but he wasn't placing it laterally he was placing it medially so towards the heart so he was moving closer and closer towards vital organs so i told him to stop and i told him to rather reassess and let's have a look at what's actually going on with this patient and what i found was that the patient wasn't actually tensioning he had a sucking chest wound on his back which they had put a gauze down and then a three-sided dressing on top of a gauze, which is obviously not going to cause a one-way valve. So we removed that dressing, placed another three-way dressing, and then suddenly the patient went from struggling to breathe to breathing absolutely fine on his own. One, we need to know if we're going to place another needle, we need to go one finger lateral, so outwards, not towards the heart. If we are going to be placing a needle to decompress, we also need to have a better understanding of when it is needed and when it is not needed, because it is difficult to diagnose. So guys, I hope this was useful. If it was, please hit like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.